before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Uh, my name is Bryce. Uh, this video today, we're just going to kind of wing it, or I'm rather going to kind of wing it. Normally, I have notes out and I know where I'm going, but I wanted to kind of talk to you guys more from the heart today. Uh, first of all, I hope that you guys are having a, for those who celebrate, I hope you're having a wonderful wonderful easter or ishtar weekend i hope that you're enjoying time with friends and family and enjoying lots and lots of chocolate or um if you're someone like me lots and lots of skittles because i'm not a huge chocolate fan but nonetheless i hope that you're having a very restful and and very very calm nice weekend with your loved ones with that being said, I think that this time is kind of appropriate to talk about the subject that I'm going to talk about today um, for a few reasons. For starters, we know in ancient times, this was actually the new year. The new year happened in the springtime, which makes sense to me, right? Because it's the it's the rebirthing, the, the world is coming back from the dead. That's why we have the bunny rabbits and the eggs. It represents fertility. Um, the the you know, April showers bring May flowers. We have the the regrowth of a lot of color in our world, especially for those of us in the northern hemisphere. I know I've got a lot of great people down in the southern hemisphere, so it's flipped, but nonetheless, we are at a time, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, where the world is kind of being reborn again. Um, and so this is kind of a great time to start to reevaluate things in our lives, just like in at the New Year's that we celebrate in January, which isn't really a new year, but we, we make New Year's resolutions, right? Well, the springtime is really a good time to start to reevaluate because we're coming into the flow of nature, if we're working with nature, we're coming into this time of rebirth, of resetting. That's why people do a lot of spring cleaning in their houses to kind of reset yourself, to take wisdom from past mistakes and to try to figure out where, what your trajectory is for, for the future. And so a lot of that for us, since for me specifically, I talk a lot about health on this, this channel because health and spirituality are like this. You know, I've said many times before that the root word of exorcism is exercise. Exercise um, is the foundation of spirituality. Whether people want to hear that or not, it is the foundation of spirituality. That's why in the Yoga Sutras we do asana work. That's why in all the Egyptian alchemy they were doing exercises, they were creating sweat, because that's how we actually change patterning within the body and the body, mind, spirit. If the mind changes, the body changes, the body changes the mind changes so we're creating new 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 karmic patterns and so this is a great time to start to like consider that especially if this is a new concept for you now with that being said when we come to the junction of seasons so when it comes to the springtime or the fall time anytime we have a junction of seasons you might notice things like being a little bit tired um feeling a little bit swollen uh you might you might just notice some weird little health stuff happening, sinuses get inflamed. That's normal. And at the junction of seasons in the Ayurvedic system, we don't want to do things like fast. 
You don't want to do a fasting. You don't want to do a cleansing. You want to get through the junction of seasons and then start the cla- the fasting or start the cleansing in the summertime or in the winter time when you are in a season and your body is locked and loaded into that season. With that being said, if you're already on a detox program throughout the winter and you're going into spring, that's, that's fine. But just to start something, you might want to give yourself some space um, during the this the seasonal junctions, if that makes sense. If that's confusing to you, let me know down in the comment section and I can address it later on um, in another video or to you individually. But what I wanted to talk about today is um, the Esoteric Health and Wellness series over on Gnostic TV. And I wanted to kind of come to you guys from a very, very, very personal um, perspective as to why I wanted to offer this series over on Gnostic. Now I have I also have the Esoteric Explorer series on Gnostic, which is deep dives, which is potent, scandalous deep dives that I can't do on YouTube. They're over on Gnostic. Those are fun and those are educational in a very different way. But the Esoteric Health and Wellness series that I'm also doing on Gnostic TV, I feel like I want to do this just to kind of give back to 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 humanity. And, and this is what most of you guys know this is what I do off YouTube. You know, not when I'm not on YouTube, how I make a living is I I I work I, I work at a shala. You know, I I'm the only female authorized teacher in the state of Georgia. So this is why I also want to bring this to YouTube too because I believe in this and I I you know in the sight of light we want to share we want to share stuff. We don't want to hold and hoard things for ourselves. If something works for me and has lived in life changing for me, of course I want to I want to give that share that with other people too so let me talk to you guys a little bit um, about my childhood and how i discovered this path of healing and how i discovered this lineage because you don't go into a very disciplined lineage with very disciplined teachers unless you're looking for a change and my childhood was literally hell on earth in in a lot of ways i'm still recovering at 41 years old i'm i'm still recovering from a lot of um abusc trying to watch the algorithms abusc that i suffered as a child and and some of this abusc is very layered like my school was definitely responsible for a lot of it and in fact the school that i went to is is the main um when i think about the main perpetrators it's definitely Darlington, the school that I went to, I'll go ahead and name them because that's my experience, um, is that they, things that they did were horrific um, to us. But I also experienced a lot of ABUSE at home as well. And some of this came through my health. And I don't think, in some cases, I don't think my parents realized what was happening because they didn't know. But in, with my father specifically, I think my father did know some things and was just kind of mean to me, which we're going to get into. So I'm going to kind of go through. At first, I thought I would just talk about my health struggles. But when we're looking at holistic healing, um, as far as the human body and digestion and, and you know other bodily functions, it's it's not typically just physical, right? It's also a manifestation through the emotional Now, with my digestion issues, which were very extreme as a child, a lot of it was physical, which I'm going to talk about um, in this video even deeper when we get to that. But some of it was emotional. Okay, so let's go all the way back. We got to start all the way back at the beginning. We got to start back in on February 4th of 1983. 41 years ago, um, that's when I, that's my birthday, um, I was the firstborn child of my parents. And my parents were like 25, 20, and 26 years old, I believe, when, when I was born. So I recognize now at 41 years old that that's really young to have a child. Now, I know that was normal back then. And I know that there are a lot of people that have kids even younger than that. But just generally speaking, 25 and 26 year old now being responsible for a human life is a lot. Um, there's a comedian, a little TikTok I saw from a comedian recently where he said, you know, for all the firstborn kids out there, the older kids, you were raised by people who didn't have kids. Like you, you were raised by people 
who didn't have kids. So a lot of the oldest children in the family, um, a lot of our presidents have been oldest children, a lot of CEOs are oldest children. A lot of times the oldest children in the family do end up being kind of the most responsible because their parents, they were the guinea pigs, right? They, and then when they had siblings, younger siblings, they then had to be responsible for themselves at very, very young ages. And by, by the time the siblings come along, um, your siblings are being raised by people who do have kids. So, so it's a very different childhood. Sometimes depending on which child, the perspective of which child, my sister and I had very different childhoods. Um, there was miscarriages between my sister and me. We're about three and a half years apart. Um, and yeah, it was a very different childhood. And I was, I was born sick. So I was born, um, early. I was, I think I was due actually on Valentine's day, but I came 10 days early, which isn't that big of a deal. Um, there are many kids. I have a cousin who was born like two months early and that was scary, but you know, not that big of a deal. I was very, very small when I was born. I was born, I was tiny. Um, and, uh, yeah, my, my parents were super young. Now my parents were married. They, they were married. My mother, I, I believe I was planned. I believe that they were trying for a child when I, when I came along, you know, even if they weren't trying, I, I know that my parents, obviously when my mother was pregnant, that they were going to have a child. It, yeah, they were married. They were, both of my parents came from very affluent families. Both of my parents uh, were college educated. Both went to both went to the University of Georgia. I believe my mother was an early childhood development major. She had her bachelor's in early childhood development, so she wanted to be a teacher. My father, I believe, my father has his bachelor's in science um, in animal sciences. I believe because he's a veterinarian now, which which we'll get into that. But I believe his bachelor's was in animal science, and I think he had a minor in Spanish if I remember correctly. So very well-educated people, my parents. my Both of my parents came from very stable parents. Uh, my mom, both of my grandmothers went to college, went to university, which was extremely, extremely rare. My mom's father was a surgeon, uh, the Bryce family. My name is my mother's maiden name, which we'll get to. They are all doctors. My dad's family, my, my grandfather was, uh, he went to the University of Tennessee, he was an engineer, but he owned a factory, you know, very, very affluent people, very, very um, prominent members of society. So at 25, 26, my parents are now married. They're living in South Carolina at this time. And um, my mom's family is from South Carolina. The, the Bryces are from South Carolina. They're from the coast of South Carolina. And my dad's dad is from Tennessee. My dad's mom, which we've done a show on, which I'll link that down in the description box below, is from South Georgia. So we were living, I was born in South Carolina, where my mom's family is from. My, my parents, I believe at that point, were living on a dairy farm. Um, again, if you reference the past episode we did, my, my dad's mother, my paternal grandmother's father, was a dairy farmer, a very successful, very affluent dairy farmer in South Georgia. And my father was very close to his grandfather. And so I think if I put my 41 year old eyes on the situation, I think my dad wanted to be a dairy farmer too. I think that's kind of what he wanted to do. He wanted to follow in his grandfather's footsteps and be, you know, on, on a farm. But I was born. And again, I was born, I was born very sick. So you've got a 25-year-old and a 26-year-old who now have a very sick child. Not only is it their first child, but it's a baby that's sick. And um, I do know that I was, I have accepted that I was definitely my parents' Saturn return, um, which we're not really going to get into what that is. Basically, just Cliff Notes version, everybody has a couple of Saturn returns in their life. The first one happens in your late 20s. It's basically usually around the age of 27, but that's just general. Um, it's usually when like shit gets real, you know, like like Saturn is the planet of karma, father time. And so in your late 20s, you go through your Saturn return, which is really hard. It's, it's a difficult transition. Everybody goes through it. It's a difficult transition where you go from really being a, a kid to now being an adult and having the adult responsibilities and, and nothing is going to bring upon a Saturn return, like having a baby, especially a sick baby. So I was born. Um, I was very thin. Um, the day that very tiny, the day that I was born, there was some struggles. My mother, um, 
had a hard time. Uh, my heart rate, I, I lost my heart rate. They had to kind of resuscitate my heart rate while I was still like in the stomach. And then I was born. Um, and so, and, which is interesting because I don't have like cardiovascular is, is my heart is actually one of the healthiest organs I have now. Um, I have a very low heart rate. It's always been great. So it's interesting that my first entrance into this world, that was, that was the struggle, but it might be due to my blood type, which, which we'll get to, we'll get to in a minute. So I was jaundice, meaning I was very yellow when I was born. Um, I cried a lot. I was, uh, a very, very cryy baby. I was not an easy baby. And I, and I understand that I totally, you know, feel, feel for my parents in, in that, in that way that I was not the easiest child, uh, infant cried all the time. I was colicky, jaundice. Um, I, I think the reason why I cried a lot was because I didn't feel good. Um, which we'll get to, cause of course a baby, the only communication baby has is crying. And I know that's frustrating for parents because you don't know what your child is trying to tell you. And of course, again, I was my parents' first child. So I was being raised by people who didn't have kids. And so maybe they thought it was normal. Maybe they thought that this was like what all babies did. You know, they didn't have any type of of, of um, comparison to know that really that something wasn't, wasn't right. Well, my mother nursed me for about, from what I remember her telling me like the first two weeks. And then she dried up which makes sense because my mother is very tiny um I, I think she only gained like 15 pounds with me so not a lot of weight with me so that makes sense and I know formula is not that great but in this situation when you don't when you're dried up and you're, you're you know the most important thing for a baby is to gain weight you want your baby to gain weight right so that they can grow and be healthy and so I'm glad that they had the option of formula in 1983 um but I started to basically reject um, the formula reject nutrients, I would either throw it up or it would just run right through me. So from the very beginning, I was showing um, signs of a very weak digestion system. My stomach hurt a lot. And this went into my um, toddlerhood, we'll say. I had a really hard time with juices, which I still have a hard time with juices, which I know why now, which we'll get to. Um, and I apparently one of my first words was diarrhea because so much stuff hurt my stomach. I was sick all the time, like severe digestion problems. Um, I, my mother tells a story that when I was in preschool, I asked my mom just to put like crackers and peanut butter in my lunchbox uh, because our teachers would make us eat all of our food. And I was so traumatized by food that I only wanted like crackers. And I didn't want my mom to put a lot in my lunchbox so that I wouldn't. I mean, it makes me emotional now to think about a child like begging for your, their mom not to put much food because food, you have such a traumatic relationship with food because you get so you've been you spent your whole life so sick that you you want to try even at like three years old, you want to try to control that so that you don't get sick um i remember being in church as a kid and like having to run to the bathroom and throw up just randomly like my body just rejected food and so i was in and out of the doctor's office my whole childhood just trying to figure out what was going on i remember at one point my pediatrician i actually like remember this my pediatrician said to my mother he said there's something about blonde haired blue eyed little girls they just cannot digest things. I think I know why that is now, which again, we're going to get to towards, because I have answers now as to what was going on with me as a child. And I think the blonde haired, blue eyed statement does speak highly of a particular blood type, which we're going to get to. So when I was probably in like the second grade, and I think it was a second grade because I I have a memory of my teacher and I have a memory of like missing some school and like my mom walking into my teacher's classroom to explain like I was going to be gone for a few days because I had to go to Scottish Rite, which was a, a children's hospital here in Atlanta to, to, to run some testing on my, because I remember that. So I was probably, and it was my second grade classroom. So I was probably like eight years old. Previously, I had been in Eggleston as a kid because I couldn't digest food. Um, and I remember being at Scottish Rite because that was horrific. And I remember 
that's when I found out I had an extra urinary tube, which I've talked about a lot, which again is common for my blood type, which again, we're going to talk about. But I remember being um, having an ultrasound uh, and they were looking at my colon. So the doctor was looking at through the ultrasound, just like they do for pregnant women, but like they put the gel on your stomach and they use this little camera over your belly and they look at the monitor and they can kind of see what's going on in your organs. And so she was looking at my colon, but she went down below and she saw my kidneys and my bladder. And that's when she goes, huh, your kid has three urinary tubes. She has two urinary tubes on one side and one on the other. My parents were like, what does that mean? And she's like, nothing. It just means it just means she's got an extra urinary tube. I actually think I go to the bathroom. I think I pee more than most people, but that's just my opinion. But it hasn't caused me that. That's not the cause of, of any significant health issues. And again, that's very common for my blood type to have an extra organ. So after that, they made me go to do this, this thing. I don't know what it was, but they do this thing where they make you drink this like really chalky disgusting it looks like a milkshake but it's not and you have to drink like three of them and you have to drink them really really quickly and then they lay you on a table and they watch your stomach digest so they like literally watch on camera as your stomach digest this this thing and i don't know why they specifically had this particular drink like why couldn't it just have been like a sandwich or something but i remember the drink was so disgusting it was so disgusting that my parents were not in the room with me. My parents couldn't come in the room with me because there was a lot of radiation. So it was the nurse. It was a couple of nurses. And it was me, this eight-year-old, sitting on this table. And they brought me this drink and a straw. And I had to drink it really fast. And I remember I started crying because it was so gross. And I was gagging because it was so gross. And the nurse started yelling at me. She started yelling at me that I'm wasting their time and that my parents are doing all these things to try to fix my health and how dare I just not drink the drink and I'm crying on the table. I'm gagging because it's so gross. And then the doctor comes in and bless this guy's heart. I think he was pissed off at this nurse because I'm an eight-year-old kid. Like I'm a tiny little child at this time and I'm in this big hospital and they can't figure out why, why I'm getting sick all the time. I was throwing up in the middle of the night. Like, what's going on? And so this doctor comes in with a, a chocolate a bottle of chocolate. And he sits beside me on the table and he starts rubbing my back. And he says, I know you're scared. I know that you're, you don't feel well. And we're really, really trying to figure out why you throw up so much. We really want to help you, but we know you're scared. And he goes, and I know that tastes really bad. Like the doctor was like, I know that's disgusting. He's like, so I have this bottle of chocolate that I remember this conversation. He was like, I keep this bottle of chocolate here so that I can put chocolate in my milk sometimes because my wife doesn't let me keep chocolate in the house. He goes, I tell you what, I'll put some chocolate in this drink for you because it'll make it taste better. Is that okay? Can I put, can I share some of my chocolate? He was so nice. And I remember him saying, my wife doesn't let me keep it. And I remember thinking as an eight-year-old kid, well, you're an adult. Why can't you have chocolate? Like, I remember, like, now as an adult, I can appreciate him saying this. But he put the chocolate in my drink, and they stir it up, and I finish the drink, and then they do, they do the procedure. And they still couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, the doctor told my parents that there was a possibility that I might be missing some en enzymes in my stomach, and that might be why I'm having trouble digesting foods and um and just to keep an eye on my reaction to certain foods there might just be certain foods that i can't eat and basically like it's not life-threatening it sucks but um, they also said be careful with dairy like just don't give her like milk at night or anything just be very careful anyway so at that from, from from the time i was eight years old all the way up till high school which was the next time i went to a doctor because of my digestion i basically and i remember I still do this. Like I can walk into a restaurant and I can smell and I can tell you whether I'm going to be sick or not. I started being able to do that as a very young child, like walking into a restaurant and telling my parents, I'm going to be sick here. Now I didn't know it at the time. I know it now. What I was smelling was the oil and oil does play huge into this, which again, we're going to get to. Um, and so my mother started to listen to me. When I would tell my mother I didn't want to eat something or when I would tell my mother my stomach hurt when I ate something, she immediately would take action. She really was really good about allowing me to kind of feed myself, like to tell her what was working and what, what wasn't working. 
My father, though, was a totally different story. The only way I can say about my dad, now I do have some good memories with my father. Like I do remember him playing Barbies with me a few times when I was really, really little. Um, I, I remember him like holding my hand and walking to the park. I remember him pushing me on the swing. Like I have some good memories with my dad, but most of my memories with my dad are memories of aggression, um, memories of anger. And memories of him just being mean to me. Like my, my dad was just, that's the only way I can really describe it. When I was a kid, he was just mean to me. He wasn't mean to my sister like he was to me. I know my father really wanted a son. I get that. And if you're a man watching right now and you really want a son, but you end up only end up with daughters, like don't let your daughters know that. Like, love your daughters just as much as you would love your son. Like, I get that he wanted a son. He's never had a son. And, and, and maybe there was a reason for that. Like, I don't know if a, a brother would have fared well if he had not been the, the son that my dad maybe wanted him to be, if, if you know what I mean. Um, but I, I took a lot of that, that, that brunt from my dad. Now, my dad um, I've talked about this before because I have struggled also with body dysmorphia, which I'll put, I'll link that video down below too, if you missed that. Um, my father, um, the Watson side of my family, uh, they're, they're tall people. Like they're tall. Like my, my grandfather was six, five. My dad is six, four. My great aunt was six feet tall. You know, they're just tall people. Um, my dad again he was six four he was when i was a kid he was tall and he was very svelte he was very chiseled he had chiseled cheekbones and like very thin very fit he was a swimmer he still held records at his high school high school i ended up going to um very you know athletic he had uh, dark brown hair and these like really light blue eyes and i remember i had a babysitter that i would always talk about my dad being like hot which is disgusting. Like that would make me, you know, so my dad, but looking back, kind of giving that information to you, I think my dad, first of all, had a lot of aggression towards my mom's family and thus me. And also I think my dad had a lot of attention from women. I know that that sounds weird, but I think he got a lot of attention from women outside of the home. And so any type of pushback he dealt with, in the home it made it like worse if that makes sense i don't know this is me trying to look back on my childhood but when i was born again kind of going back again to me being born with my father um he was working on this dairy farm and i think it was my mom's dad that was like all right you have a grandchild now you have my granddaughter you now need to go to vet school and i don't know if my dad wanted to go to vet school he's a really guy will say he might not be the greatest dad but he's a really good veterinarian he's really good at what he does he's really good with animals but from what i understand from what i remember being told to me that my mom's dad who was a surgeon kind of came down hard on my dad like you and that's the south right like in the south men are the providers the woman is to be provided for and now you've got a, a daughter You've got a child now, so you need to stop playing on the farm and you need to go to vet school. And so my father went to the University of Georgia, the, the vet school. So we moved from South Carolina to Athens, Georgia. My sister was born in Athens. Um, my, I, I believe my, we lived in a house in Athens, even though my parents were really young. And I, from what I understand, my mom's father actually paid for that house because of me and my sister because he wanted his grandchildren to have a yard and a house so i think there was a lot of pressure put on my father at a very young age from his in-laws probably from his parents too because again my dad comes from affluent people as well so probably from his parents too but there was just a lot of pressure put on him at the age of like 25 26 years old to to all of a sudden have this career and have you know take care of your your children and you know, blah 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 so I think my father took a lot of that out on me as a child. I Again, I was the firstborn. So I was the Saturn return. I was the, the wrecking ball that came in and forced this to happen. I also had a lot of health problems 
I also have my mom's maiden name. So Bryce is my mother's maiden name. If I had been born a boy, I would have been named after my father. But because I was born a girl, I was named after my mother's family. So I'm just this walking reminder of the fact that my dad had to grow up. And then I have all these medical issues. Now, I do remember my dad going to these doctor's appointments with me. I do remember him being sweet sometimes. Like, I remember sitting in his lap when they were taking my blood. I remember sitting in my dad's lap. My mom was was standing in the room, and I sat in my dad's lap when they were taking my blood for me because I was a little kid. So, you know, getting your blood drawn as a little kid is 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 scary and painful and all, and all that stuff. So I do remember my dad being kind to me from time to time. But he was also, on the flip side, was mean to me a lot. Um, when it came to food, my father was of the opinion that since he was the parent, that we should eat what was put in front of us. And he was really big on us cleaning our plates. I remember getting into knockdown, screaming fights with my father, like crying because my father was trying to force me to eat something that I knew was going to hurt my stomach, was going to make me sick. And then I had my mother who's defending me and telling my dad, like, she can't eat this. Like, she cannot eat this. She's going to be sick all night tonight. She, it's going to make her sick. She's not going to be able to go to school tomorrow. I, I We're going to be up all night with her throwing up. Like, she cannot eat this, Lee. She can't. My dad's name is Lee. She can't eat this. And I remember these just... So what started off was him, like, being aggressive towards me would end up him and my mom fighting about it. And my mom being like, and then he would bring up the whole, like, these are bad manners. This is her being rude. And my mother was like, no, it's not. This is her trying, this is us trying to preserve her health, Lee. Like, she's been dealing with this since the day she was born. And when I eat something that my stomach cannot digest, my stomach will swell up. It's done it since I was a kid. Like, if I eat something I can't digest before I throw up, it will swell up. I look like I'm pregnant. Like, I would be like a four-year-old walking around with, like, what looks like a pregnant belly because I ate something I'm allergic to. My body's panicking and swelling. And so, and my dad had been at these doctor's appointments. He had heard these prognoses. He had heard the doctor say, let her guide you. Let her tell you what she can eat and what she can't eat in order to keep her stomach. Trust her when she tells you something hurts her stomach. My dad heard all that. But it was like this power struggle, this aggression that I needed to eat what he told me to eat, regardless of whether I was sick or not. And so there was a lot of... Um, there was a lot of contempt I had for my dad. Um, I, I at forty one, I'm under no illusions that my father like really loved me. I think he loved me in the sense that he was my dad. He would tell you he loved me, but I don't think he had the capacity to actually like thoroughly love me as his daughter. Like my mother had that capacity to be like. This is a this is a this is a this is a different situation. Like she's not, you know, my sister and I, you know, and other, you know, if we ate with our elbows on the table or if we had bad table manners in general, we would get flicked on the head. Like even my mother would like flick us on the head. So we had to have good table manners. We had to sit at the table and wait for everyone to be done and then take our plate and clear our plate. We had good table manners. It was just that I could not eat certain foods. It it all came down to him wanting me, wanting to control what I ate. And even my grandparents, my mom's parents ended up passing away. I was like four when my grandfather died. I was nine when my grandmother died. So the only grandparents that I really had growing up were my dad's parents. And they were amazing. I loved my dad's parents so much. And they even understood. So we would go and have like Sunday lunch with my dad's parents. And my grandmother and grandfather were very much like, if Bryce can't eat this, totally fine and my grandmother i remember her crouching down in the kitchen and looking at me and like i was little being like what can i get you what 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 and she's like i'm gonna be going to the grocery store this week what is it that i what snack food can i get you so that when you come here you can have a snack what like very loving very kind very understanding that this was something that was not in my control that this was a health issue um and so so that was kind of like the emotion. So when I talk about like health issues being both physical and emotional, whenever my father would throw a temper tantrum about this, it would make it worse. I would all of a sudden have even 
worse stomach issues. And it turned out later I, in my teenage years, I ended up having lower back issues and having to have lower back surgery. That was around the time my father actually left, which if you're looking at Muladhara, Mulabunda, that Mula area, the area that makes a lot of sense as to why my back went out at that point. Well, now I, I know at 41 too, when I have really bad digestion problems, my back typically hurts. So there is a correlation between the two. So I started to really not like my father, like just did not like my father. Um, as a teenager, just didn't like my dad. Um, it got to the point where uh, my my dad my dad was also having affairs, so he wasn't really like when I got into my teenage years, like he wasn't really there that much. I think we thought he was working, but so my mother would take my sister and me out to eat a lot for dinner, um, which was great because then I could just order what I wanted anyway. Um, and so that's why I don't know how to cook um, is because. There was a lot going on in my, my teenage years. Well, around the age of 15, I started to struggle again with my stomach. And I think what was happening too at that point was I was hanging, you know, we were getting our learner's permit. And then some of the kids were turning 16 and learning how to drive. So not only was I going to friends' houses, but we were driving around doing things. And I wanted to eat, you know, the French fries with my friends. I wanted to get the, you know, the cheese pizza with my friends. I would eat things that I knew or there was this big Mexican restaurant. We would go this particular Mexican restaurant. I would go with my friends and I wanted to be like my friends. So I would eat the things they were eating and I would end up getting sick later. And so that was more on me. But I do remember going to a doctor, a colon doctor when I was like 15 um, again and saying, you know, she can't, she's, her digestion again is not, not working. And um, <laughs> I remember the doctor being like, you just need to eat more fiber. <laughs> And I remember looking at the doctor at 15 and being like, that doesn't work. Like, that doesn't work. I'm like, because, you know, fiber, like, you remember that cereal fiber one? I don't know. They, maybe they still make it. I don't know. My mother would, like, go and get me fiber one cereal. And all fiber does is it, like, swells in your colon. And if you can't go to the bathroom, like, if you're, if you have missing enzymes and can't go to the bathroom, it's just going to swell in your stomach and sit there. Like, it's just going to sit there. So I remember looking at the doctor. Like, I remember, like, my face changed. Like, like he was an idiot. And I was like, that doesn't work. <laughs> like, maybe that works for a normal person who's just got a little bit of constipation. But that's not going to work for me. That doesn't work. Fiber doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, and I remember walking out of the doctor's office. And I said to my mom, I was like, he had no idea what he was talking about. Like, I remember saying that to my mom. My mom was like, well, he's a doctor. And I was like... He's got no idea what he's talking about. Little did I know that he absolutely had no idea what he was talking about because about 15 years later, I would find myself in India where I would actually figure out why I had digestion problems. But I digress. So I ended up, you know, going going to school, going off to LA. I, you know, got real skinny when I was in LA because um, nobody eats in LA. And also I... Because nobody eats in LA, it wasn't weird that I would skip meals sometimes. Um, again, I do believe I have a trauma when it comes to food. Still at 41, I'm pretty traumatized by food because it's made me sick a lot of my life. So, um, you know, nobody noticed in LA if I would like skip dinner or like not eat a lot of my food. So I was, you know, in high school, I weighed about 98 pounds. I remember when I left Los Angeles, I weighed. In my mid twenties, I weighed 106 pounds, so I was tiny, so skinny, and I started in, in that time. I did start. I had been a, a runner, which I do know why I am in, in gravitate towards cardiovascular running. I, I'm O negative, which we're going to get. That means I have more oxygen in my blood. I also think that I. This is another contention my father and I had. My father was very athletic. Like I said, he held records still at the school. I'm athletic. My sister's super athletic. But I don't care about competition. Like I don't understand people who are competitive, especially when it comes to things like American football. Like I don't understand why people get so obsessed with football. I don't get it. Bread and circus, bread and circus. It doesn't matter. Whatever team wins or loses, it doesn't matter. Your life doesn't change. So I was never competitive. My father was. And that was a contention between us because I was athletic but didn't give a shit. And so that was very, that was hard for my dad too. Well, 
I, looking back now, when I was a long distance runner in high school, when I did swim, and then getting into yoga, what I was looking for was a meditation. Now, I haven't even gotten into the whole paranormal side of my childhood. That's a story for a different day. I'm just talking about the basic human stuff. I did go through a lot of paranormal stuff. I could always see ghosts. I got attacked a lot spiritually. Again, that's a story for a different day, which I can talk about that in another episode if you guys want. But I really want to focus more on the third density stuff, the matrixy health stuff that we all have to contend with when we're here in the third density. So anyway, where was I? So I'm in Los Angeles. I, I look back now, I, I know all the exercises that I gravitated tor towards were more meditations. I was meditating. I was finding um, peace in the long runs. I was finding that, you know, you know, back then we had like Walkmans and like CD Walkmans, you put a CD in, but when you were running it would scratch. So most of the time until the iPods came out, I would go for runs with nothing and just be in silence. I loved it. I loved it. So then I find yoga. I start, you know, the Ashtanga journey. I start really diving into philosophy and really restudying all of these old scriptures. I end up going to India at this time. And so when I'm in India, I decide in my early 30s, I decide that I am going to go to an Ayurvedic clinic for the first time because I know now from my philosophical studies that a lot of my health issues are what we call karma. And karma is just cause and effect. It's just your work. It's something to learn from. And I also know that a lot of my health issues are coming from emotional stress. Even though there's some biological factors, it's also very emotional too. So that's when I discovered the dosha system. I've talked about the dosha system a lot on this channel. I will tag, again, some videos down below under show notes of past episodes I've done on the dosha system. The dosha system has flat out saved my life. I realized when I went to this Ayurvedic doctor that I am what is called a vata pitta. So there's three doshas, vata, pitta, kapha. I have like the only kapha thing about me is my hair. I have very thick hair, which I did get from my dad. I did get my thick hair from my dad. His is dark. Mine's blonde. His is brown though. Um, but I, my sister also has thick hair. That's like the only kappa thing that I have in my biological makeup. The Another kappa thing trait that I have is I tend to keep friends for a very long time. Like I still have my friends from high school, some of my friends from high school. Um, so I do tend, that's another kappa trait. But as far as the rest of my body, it's very vata. And so what that means, vata is cerebral, it's air. So vata is air, pitta is fire. And kappa is like earth water. So athletic people are pitta. My second leading dosha is pitta. So I'm air and fire. All right. I need more kappa. So because I lead vata, that means I'm naturally very thin. I have very bony, bony uh, bones. I've got, you know, very bony knees, very small, very small wrist, very small ankles. Um, I, I, I tend to be on the thinner side. I, you know, I um, have dry skin. I overthink things a lot. Um, one of the side effects of being vata is high anxiety, um, trouble sleeping. I've, I've never been a big sleeper. I only really get about five, six hours at the best. And I typically more like four or five hours. And that's just how I've been my whole life since I was a little kid. So that also means that my organs are dry. My organs are dry. My colon's dry. So when I eat vata foods, because foods are also energy and dispositions, just like the human body. So when I would eat vata foods like apples, raw apples, or because I would eat that a lot as a kid, we would get um, apples and peanut butter as snack all the time. Now, relatively speaking, in the Western world, we think that's healthy. Well, that's 
like giving me arsenic. Like that's as someone who's Vata, that's what was causing a lot of these problems was I was eating salads. Salads are Vata foods. Juices are Vata foods. I already have too much Vata. So my body was panicking and freaking out. It didn't, it couldn't digest. It's too Vata. It's too dry. So it couldn't digest another dry food. So what I needed was more Kapha foods. I needed more root vegetables. If I wanted to eat an apple, it needed to be a cooked apple. I needed to change the chemistry of the apple. So by realizing this, and also, again, I said I would bring up oils with oils. The best oil for a vata is almond oil. Olive oil, coconut oil are detrimental to a vata. Coconut oil is only good for coppice. Right, kapas need more apples, more vata food. Vatas need more kapa food. And so I started to learn, oh, things were making sense now. There were foods that I knew as a kid people would give me and I wouldn't be able to eat it. It would make me sick. And then I would look back at those foods and be like, those are vata foods. Oh my God, this makes sense. I also became a vegetarian at a very young age, at the age of 14, because every time I would eat meat, I would get sick. So I stopped eating meat. That was one of the last big arguments I had with my dad. I was like 14 years old. We were in Colorado skiing. We went to a steakhouse. I didn't want to order a steak. I wanted to order like sides. And my dad got really mad, screamed at me and told me, how dare I be so ungrateful. I'm in this expensive steakhouse on this expensive ski trip. How dare I be a little snob. I should take advantage. And I, he forced me to eat a steak. And I ended up that night with my mother sitting by my side, projectile vomiting all night. And my mother sat on that bathroom floor with me. And I even remember the pajamas I had on. They were purple silky purple pajamas from the limited two y'all remember the limited two well i thought they were so grown up and i remember sitting on the floor in those pajamas hanging over this toilet and my mother sitting on the bathroom floor with me and she just saying to me she's just like bryce you just can't eat meat you and so that's how i became a vegetarian she was right i can't i can't eat meat it makes me sick i get sick and when I was a little kid, I knew that. Like when I would go to the pool, like we would go to the country club pool without our parents, they'd have lifeguards and I'd be my, with my little friends and we'd have a kid's menu and we could write our parents' number down and all of my friends would order like chicken fingers. I always ordered grilled cheese. So I already kind of knew, as, a, as the original doctor said when I was eight years old, just let her tell you what she wants to eat. She knows what she can eat. I would always, but my dad, my dad is one of those people, even though he's a veterinarian, he's one of those people that thinks if you're not eating meat, then you're a freak. So anyway, so all of a sudden, when I'm learning about the dosha system, these things start to make sense to me. All of a sudden, the, 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 when the math wasn't mathing before, the math started to math now. I started to realize, and then I started to notice when I followed a good diet for my dosha, I started to notice that my anxiety got better. I was calmer. I was more grounded. I wasn't as stressed out. My arthritis, I was struggling with arthritis, which is also a vata disorder. That started to get better too. And then in my mid to late 30s, right before I got on YouTube, I figured out blood types. I always knew there was something weird about my blood. Like my, my mom's dad would say all the time that, oh, she's got that royal family blood because I am through my mom's father, my, my maternal grandfather. I'm related to the royal family through him. And what he was talking about was I'm O negative. I'm O blood. I have no antigens in my blood and I'm neg I have no rhesus factor in my blood. Now, up until this point in my life when I started to put two and two together the only real big thing I knew about being a female who's RH negative is that it could affect my ability to have children in the sense that if I were to have a baby with a man who was RH positive I probably would have to have a lot of help my sister is also RH negative she's B negative she's not O negative she's B negative so she's had some different issues but she's had to have help with her kids right so that's the one thing I knew about my blood type except my boyfriend is also RH negative so I don't think I would have the same issues because we're both RH negative so I, we wouldn't have an RH positive baby anyway but that's all I knew and then I realized that there was a huge 
huge, huge. There's all this information about us RH negatives. It's only 15% of the world's population is RH negative. And I'm reading, I'm researching this and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, like this is me. This is all of my health issues. RH negatives, especially O negatives, generally speaking, O negatives have terrible digestions. We can't digest anything. We have no antigens in our blood. We have no rhesus factor in our blood. So you're telling me not only am I O negative, so I, I already have the predisposition to not be able to digest, but I'm also Vata on top of it. All of a sudden, I was like, this is why I have been in and out of the hospital my whole damn life. Because I'm O negative and I'm Vata. That's it. And if we in the Western world understood, especially the dosha system, it would have saved me so much pain as a child. I would have done, I would have flourished because I would have been able to know what exactly to eat or what was going on, what was actually happening. So I realized too, as you know, I was diagnosed with astigmatism. I have my glasses right here. I don't have astigmatism. No RH negative has astigmatism. That's just what we're diagnosed with. What we have is the back of our eyes are shaped like a diamond. And so it filters light differently. This is why I see ghosts. This is why I can see ghosts and other people can't. My eye is shaped differently. I take in light differently. My resting temperature, body temperature is 96. What's the average? Like the average is 98.6 or something. I'm at 96. That's always been my resting temperature since I was a kid. Guess what? That's normal for an RH negative. That's normal for an RH negative. You know who else was RH negative? My grandfather, my mom's dad. And he's, his resting temperature was at like 96 too, the surgeon. He knew that, that our that body temperature was just lower. Oh, also, RH negatives tend to have extra organs. I have an extra urinary tube. Some O negatives have an extra liver or extra kidney. That just happens with us. And remember how I said my pediatrician, when I was really little, I remember him telling my mother there's something about blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girls who have terrible digestion. And remember how I said 15% of the world is RH negative? Well, about 90% of that 15%, guess what, my friends? Blonde-haired, blue-eyed people or red-haired people, the recessive traits. There's a small, 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 small percentage of people in Africa and Asia who are RH negative, very small percentage. Majority of people who are RH negative come from the Pyrenees Mountain, the Basque people who are all blonde hair, blue eyed people. So this genetic blood type that I have, which also is showing up in other side effects, having blonde hair, having blue eyes, having an extra urinary tube, having a low body temperature, having a, a stigmatism. This is all a, a bad digestion. This is all coming from my blood type. Which if you're new to this channel, I've done a lot of deep dives into blood types because this fascinates me so, so, so much. I'll, I'll put those episodes down in the description box below as well. There's so much more. We don't have junk DNA. It's, it's just so much more than what, what they're telling us. Then I realized with exercise, of course, exercise being the base of spirituality, that with a lot of, so with, with my long distance running that I was doing way back then, um, most most of our professional athletes, guess what blood type they have? Guess what blood type they have? O negative. Why? Why? You take in more oxygen when you are O negative. You have more oxygen in your blood. You can go for longer. You have higher endurance rates. Ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. This is why 
I can run long distances and be fine. I also realized that when you do things like running or Ashtanga yoga, what it does to your colon is it jiggles your colon and it moves and helps your colon digest. So even way back when, when I didn't, I hadn't connected the dots, I just knew that when I did this particular thing, not only did I feel better mentally, but I felt better physically too. And now I have all the answers to this riddle. Now I know exactly why I am the way I am. I also know from emotional level that it it intensified because my father, uh, being Vata, I took it very seriously when my father would be mean to me over things that were out of my control. I really took it to heart because I'm Vata. If I were more Kappa based, I'd probably be like, ah, fuck you and just go away. But I took it so, so it made it worse, right? It, it, It made, the stress made it worse. So, With that being said, I do not have a relationship with my father anymore. I haven't spoken to my father in years, um, and I'm totally okay with that. I'm actually better off. I do get upset that, you know, from time to time that, you know, I'm just very grateful that my nephews and my nieces have an incredible father. My brother-in-law is amazing. I'm so happy that my sister did not repeat this, this pattern and that she married a really, really, really good man. My father and my mother are no longer married. Um, my father is remarried to a woman that also is mean to us <laughs> that, uh, does not really allow us to have anything to do with my dad's family. Um, I was very close to my grandparents though. I had great grandparents. And so now that they're no longer living, I, I, I'll go more into that with my, I'm I'm filming again again with Bobby on this upcoming week to go deeper into the equipment story. And so I'll I'll go deeper into this, this side of things in in that, that story, because that's been very healing for me because I didn't know much about my dad's family because my dad never, I've I've said this before, my father um, always made us feel like we were not Watsons, like we were not a part of, like we were guests. My grandparents never made us feel that way. My grandparents were amazing and just, I'm so proud to be Ed and Marianne Watson's granddaughter. I, they're just amazing. We're amazing people. But my dad did not make us feel like we we had we were entitled to that family. Um, don't really know my cousins. My dad had two sisters. Uh, I have four cousins on that side of the family, and I don't really know them. Um, whereas my cousins on my mom's side of the family, they're like my siblings. So, um, so that just kind of shows you the difference in the way that, and that, that, that comes from my father. That's all my father's doing. So, um, and before anybody asked, I am absolutely my father's daughter. If you saw my father, I look a lot like my mom's side of the family, but if you saw my dad, a picture of my dad and me, you would definitely know that that's, that's my dad. I, I have a lot of similarities with my father as well. So you can definitely tell that I am 100% his child. So it's nothing like that. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm biologically, he's my dad. Trust me. I've done the 23 and me and fa- people from his side of the family have popped up. It's 100%. That's my dad. So before anybody comments that, like it was just, that's his issue. And, and through a lot of therapy and, and work on myself through my own spiritual work, I have been able to understand that that is his issue. The way he treated me as a child. I'll give you guys another story about the way my father treated me as a child. When I was like 12 years old, I was I, I actually, I remember I was exactly 12 years old. My grandfather, my dad's dad, my mom's parents had since passed away. My grandfather, my paternal grandfather, owned a pillow factory. He had made a lot of money. He was very successful. He had copyrighted and owned a lot of patents to different pillows. He was the pillow guy. And um, he had this factory. And my father, I was, meanwhile, my sister and I were went to this very hoity-toity private school, the same hoity-toity private school my father went to, mind you. He went to the same school. Um, my father decided that it was a really good idea for me at 12 years old to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go to my grandfather's pillow factory and basically be the janitor, like sweep out the pillow factory. And I remember my parents talking about it in the car, and I remember my mom getting really upset, my mom being like, no way am I going to allow my 12-year-old daughter to do this. She's not, our 12-year-old daughter is not doing this. She is absolutely not doing this. She's not getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and sweeping out a pillow factory at 12 years old. Absolutely not. 
and my parents argued about it. And then I remember my grandfather, because then we were at my grandparents' house and my dad was telling his dad that he really wants to teach me responsibility and that he wants um, me to go to his pillow factory at four o'clock in the morning before school and clean the, clean the factory. And my grandfather, now mind you, my, again, my grandfather was like six, five. They called him big Ed, Ed, cause he was so free. He had these long legs, so tall. And my dad was like six, four. So these big giant, I'm like this little kid sitting there at the table and these big giants are like, <laughs> I saw the look in my grandfather's face <laughs> and my grandfather was eating and I saw him look at my dad, his son. And he was like, I am not going to allow my 12-year-old granddaughter to do that, son. He called my dad Buck. He was like, Buck, we're not put. I am not allowing my 12-year-old daughter to be in that vulnerable of a position in that factory. Absolutely not. And I didn't know what my grandfather meant by vulnerable of position. Like, I remember thinking like, oh, is somebody going to break in and rob the place? Like, I didn't know what he meant. What he meant was he had a night crew. So there were employees, men, working in the factory overnight. And my grandfather didn't get to the factory until like nine o'clock in the morning because he oh, he was the owner. He was the boss. He's the boss man, right? And my grandfather was really good at his employees. And I, I know he would never hire somebody that he thought was predatory. But now as an adult, I reminiscing on that conversation, I know what he meant. I was a 12 year old girl. It was a night crew full of men. I was going to be dropped off at the factory to sweep out at 12 years old with a bunch of men and nobody there to protect me. And of course at 12, I didn't understand what he was saying, but that's what my grandfather was saying. And I remembered the anger he got at my father for my father thinking that that was a good idea. Like not only is it not a good idea because I'm 12 years old and no 12 year old should do that. No, I know a lot of 12 year olds work on their family farms, like get up and, but that's very different than being the janitor at your grandfather's pillow factory at 12. You should be sleeping at four o'clock in the morning when you're 12 years old. The anger that my grandfather had towards my father in that moment, like how dare you put my granddaughter, your daughter in harm's way like that, like just putting her in harm's way like that. So that was another thing about my dad. Like he, he put us in harm's way a lot. There was an issue when I was an adult where he actually did, did something like that to me. I was in the midst of being inappropriately I was at his house and my stepmother was there. My stepmother's brother was there and the brother was being really, really creepy. I was in my twenties. I am not allowed at my house, my dad's house anymore. That's fine. Um, and I went to my dad's bathroom. It was the 4th of July. So I was going to go shower and change and go meet my mom and my stepdad at his family stuff. So I was in the bathroom and I was, I was like 24, 25 years old and I had just gotten in the shower and I was changing and my stepmother's brother just walked into the bathroom. And he had been kind of inappropriate with me the whole time I was there. Like, I really was trying to, like, tell my dad, like, I, I'm not okay with this. And I, I said, like, what are you doing? I'm getting, I, I'm getting dressed. Can you please leave the room? My dad walks by and then walks out of the house with my stepmother. Didn't protect me. Didn't say anything to her, his brother-in-law, basically. Like, this is not appropriate. You know, I was in my mid-20s at the time. These This guy was, like, in his 50s and 60s. Like, my daughter asked you to leave. She's getting dressed. Like, what are you doing? I left my dad's house with, like, wet hair, no makeup. I was supposed to go to this really nice little room. I had to go to my mom and, like, find a place to, like, finish getting ready because, and I, I remember telling my mom, I was like, I think he was going to RAP me. And my dad... And dad just walked out, like did not do anything. So that's my dad for you. Um, I know people in the town love my dad. He's a great, he's a great veterinarian and he's really good to the town, but kind of a shitty father, mean, very mean to us. So, um, so yeah, but I'm good. I'm good now. Like I've gone through therapy. I've gone through, I, I totally recognize I'm absolutely, I'm grateful 
I'm grateful for the learning experience. I'm grateful that I was given the chance to learn how to stand on my own without my father. And I have an incredible, incredible partner. So I've definitely healed a lot of daddy wounds. I dated a lot of really bad men and then healed that. And now I have a really, really good partner. So anyway, I'm rambling on now. So with that being said, with this story time, a little bit about my personal personal life and, and the things that I've had to overcome and the, the friction and the karma that I've had to work through and the gift. So all of that 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 horrific childhood I had actually gave me a gift because it gave me a place to want to change, right? You, you, if you're comfortable, you're not going to change. If you're comfortable, you're not. That's why we have friction. That's why God allows the devil to roam around, right? Because it gives us, and it, it, it forces us to make choices. It forces us to course correct. And so going to India and learning all of this and having my life completely changed, like a 180 completely changed where now my digestion is great. Uh, for the most part, it's great. I, I I now know I know what to do the minute it's not great. I know exactly what to do. And I'm able to teach people this and work people through this and give people this gift as well. It it's it's t was totally worth it. And so if you are if this is resonating with you, if you are resonating with this, then I would absolutely suggest going to Gnostic TV to the Esoteric Health and Wellness series. I've got multiple videos on the subject already up on there. I've got multiple exercise videos. And on top of that, you guys, I've spoken to Jay about this. We are planning, we're gearing up as Gnostic grows to do like live classes, like we're like live exercise classes, live movement classes, um, maybe live workshops over the dosha system, all that kind of stuff. And so we are working on doing that. That is something that is in the works. But in the meantime, while we're working on doing that, I am, I've created a workshop called the Alchemy of Movement. Now, this particular workshop is going to get more into the physical body and moving the physical body and where certain um, certain bundas are, certain energetic locks are in the body, which does go hand in hand with diet and nutrition and eating. And so I'm putting together this workshop. We're going to be doing two different live workshops here in Atlanta. Um, one at Ashtanga Yoga Atlanta has the dates have not been released yet and one up at Sacred Garden Yoga in Marietta. Those workshops in person with me are going to be about $100 a person. And the reason why they're priced at that is because you're actually going to get a hands-on I'm going to be there to actually hands-on help you and be able to see you in person. However, I'm also going to plan a day probably for the end of April for all of my friends in other countries or other parts of the country that can't come to Atlanta. That's only going to be about $40 a person because you're you're not going to get me in person. It's going to be over Zoom. So what this is going to be, this is going to be the Alchemy of Movement Workshop. This is going to be about a two and a half three hour workshop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an actual workbook that I'm if you if you want to do this, I will and you once you sign up for it, I'll send you I'll email you the workbook. If you come to the live event events, you'll get the manual the workbook in person um, there. But over zoom, I'll email it to you. So if you come to the alchemy, it's gonna be about again $40. When you come to the alchemy of workshop event, We'll start off the first part of the workshop. We'll be going through the workbook, talking about these things um, in the physical body, the different values. We'll have a section on the doshas, the different energetic points, the meridians, the bundas, the chakras, everything. We'll talk about that, how it integrates into your body, the nadis, shashumna, where kundalini or Christ consciousness lives. And then after we do about 45 minutes of, of a lecture, where you have your own workbook for yourself in front of you at your house, we will then do about a 90 minute movement practice. So you will have to exercise. You will sweat. Um, I'll have different variations. So it doesn't matter. I don't care if you're totally out of shape or if you're a marathon runner, I'm going to have different levels, different modifications. And this is super important. This movement, this 90 minute movement class within the workshop is super important because it'll give you a chance to integrate everything we spoke about in the workbook. You'll be able to then integrate in a class with me. And then the last 45 minutes ish will be a chance for us to 
close up have we'll do a brief meditation when we're done and then we'll also have a chance for question and answers so if if you in the movement you got a question because of something we said in the workbook portion is now you're trying to integrate it and it's confusing you can then take a moment to to ask the question and i do encourage questions being asked in front of everybody because sometimes when you ask a question somebody else in the class will benefit whether they know it or not from the answer that's given and and it is it's so much easier to talk about these things in theory but to put them into practice is a totally different journey on its own so i want to give people a chance after we're done a good chunk of time to like really ask me anything go over anything all that kind of stuff. So this is going to kind of be like a pre preliminary. Now, once we get the classes going on Gnostic there, I don't think there'll be any extra charge. It will be just the charge for Gnostic. But right now, this is going to be an actual workshop, like not just a class, but an actual intensive, an actual workshop. So I have not, again, released the dates yet. I'm still looking at the dates, but I wanted to talk to you guys about that first to get your feedback, um, if that's something that you would actually be interested in. Um, for those, especially for those who don't live in Atlanta and can't come to the real life in in person workshop, right? We would, we would have to do it on on Zoom. So again, so the Zoom option would be about forty dollars. The in person would be about a hundred dollars. So, um, so anyway, you guys, um, I hope that that makes sense. I really hope I didn't ramble too much. I do think that that is it's really important for us, especially those of us who are teachers, um, to be vulnerable and to tell you, like, I, I think some. People have this misconception. I've gotten this misconception a lot, not just on Zoom, but in my live classes. I'm very physically fit. I know that about myself. I have a very flat stomach. I have a toned body. I know that about myself because I've been doing this for 18 years. I've been working out, working my body for 18 years. I'm also very naturally thin. All right. So I get a lot of people saying that, oh, I don't understand this because I've never experienced this. But the truth is I've been through hell and back. And because I've been through hell and back, what you see when you come into my class is the product of 18 years worth of work. When I was a child, though, I struggled. I wasn't healthy at all. And because I wasn't healthy, I went on this journey first as a student. And now I've been lucky enough to be granted authorization, the only female in the state of Georgia, mind you, to, to bring this forward to you as well. So what you're seeing when you see me is 18 years worth of course correcting, is proof that this works and that this has worked for me, and I hope it will work for you. And that this um, understanding your dosha, it's not the one thing, another thing I love about the dosha system is it's not one size fits all. It, it looks at your particular dosha. So I'm Vata Pitta, you might meet, be Kappa Pitta or Kappa Vata. It's gonna be totally different for you. But we, we gotta know what you are first in order to start to start where we need to start, right? Don't ever compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 10. And do not ever be arrogant enough to think that somebody else's chapter 10 is actually their chapter one, all right? I've been doing this for 18 years. So my level of physical fitness, my health is just product, is just proof that this work does work and it does help. Okay, if you put the effort in, right? So I hope that makes sense. Um, so yeah, for all those people that think that I just woke up and this was just easy for me, don't be so arrogant and ignorant, as we said with Catherine Edwards, arrogant, ignorant. No, I, I, this is 18 years. You know, that's why I was given authorization is because I have a lot of experience in this, a lot of experience, right? So, so um, yeah. And I really want to be able to pass this forward and really want to be able to give people, you know, a teacher's job is to eventually not be needed. A teacher's job is to teach themselves out of a job. I'm not a cult leader. I want to be able to set up these workshops and set up this series on Gnostic where you have all the information or the baseline of information so that you then can take that informa information and integrate it into your life and take your power back where you won't need me anymore to answer your questions. I'll be here at the beginning to answer your questions, to show you your blind spots. It's important to have a teacher show you your blind spots too, but I want to be able to teach myself out of a job teach myself out of you needing me. 
Okay, so let me know if that's something you guys would like. I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful Easter weekend. Um, we've got some exciting shows coming up this week. I will not be on with Aquarius Rising Africa on Monday, but I will be back the next Monday, and I will be back this Wednesday, this upcoming Wednesday, the 3rd, I believe, of April. We're going to be going into the Laurie Vallow case with Shanti, and y'all, talk about some bash it, crazy, delusional, spiritual people. Just like Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrand. We're going to go into Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. So, and the whole Visions of Glory book. So, I'm super excited. I was laughing, as I said, in the um, Bigfoot Part 2 we did with Jessica and Shanti. Mondays on Aquarius Rising Africa, we're doing Delusional Dead People. And then Wednesdays on Solutions with Shanti, we're doing Delusional Alive People. So, you know, if you want to join in for that, I'd love to have you. And you can obviously give your feedback as well what you think about i think chad daybell's trial starts monday i think so she Lori's already been found girls already in prison for life Lori's already been locked away throw the key away chad's trial starts monday though so all right you guys with that being said happy easter have a wonderful weekend and i'll talk to you soon bye everybody No